So I'd like you to do something for me. It's very, very simple. You do it on a daily, if not weekly, basis. I'd like you to choose from these 45 or so symbols a password made out of five of them. So pick any five, create yourself a little story, choose a password. No stress here. <coughs> okay, it's very difficult for me to see, so I'm going to assume that most of you have got a five symbol password picked uh, from these symbols. Here, you probably can't read it from the back, are a, the password rules that we commonly see on online banking. So I'd like you to choose a password, not a password that you use for anything else. It has to be between six and 20 characters in length. It can be letters or numbers. Um, it shouldn't be all ones or all A's. It shouldn't have any other personally identifying data in it, so not your date of birth. And it shouldn't have sequences, A, B, C, one, two, three. Okay, so we're asking you to remember two passwords. One made of symbols, one made of words, and one that uh, shouldn't be one you've used before. Okay, so hoping everybody's done that. For the last 60 years or so, every piece of computing technology has changed dramatically. The user interface, we now have touch screens, pinch and zoom, which we didn't have in the early days when punched paper tape was the way we put data into computers. We have screens, we have memory in the terabytes, we have hard storage that can store more data than human beings have ever created in known history. And we have smaller and smaller devices. But one thing that hasn't changed since 1955 when it was first used in computing, is the password. So a bunch of guys at MIT were working on a computer system that would be used by more than one person. And they realized that the most precious resource they had at the time, which was processing power, needed to be protected. So as a senior researcher at MIT, you could have four hours of processing time on this computer. November 1961, they turned it on. You could log in with your username and password. That's the first time in computing history it was used. 1962, in the spring, the date is uncertain. Alan Schur decided that he needed more than his four hours. So one evening, he thought, I know what I'll do, I'll print the file that contains everybody's passwords. The following morning, he made sure he was first in the office and he picked up the printout and he went and started logging in as everybody so that he could have lots of processing time. He was reasonably clever about this data breach in that he took the pages of the password file and left them lying around so that all of his friends would be implicated. It was a couple of years ago that he fessed up. <laughs> so, since that time, 55 years, the password has been essentially unchanged. Notably, uh, shortly after that, there was a bug in the system, and whenever somebody logged on to the computer, it showed the whole password file on the screen. This was about 1964, this was the first point that somebody thought, perhaps we should encrypt the password file. Let's fast forward a little bit. 1974, the first commercial computer access system was developed. And it used hand geometry. So now, this is my password. The key problem there is that hand geometry isn't as unique as you want it to be. So actually, lots of us will share some hand geometry. And we've moved on quite rapidly since that time. So we now have 
uh, fingerprint technology. So your phone may well have a little sensor here which can incredibly reliably identify your fingerprint to unlock your phone. So reliably that the banks are prepared to let you use that to pay for something. Contactless payments, which many of you will have used, is limited at £30. Apple Pay, there is no upper limit. It is your credit limit because the banks have accepted that your thumbprint can be very, very reliably used on your phone. Except that the bank doesn't know whether it's actually me. The phone doesn't know whether it's actually me. The only thing the phone knows is that the thumbprint that I trained it with is the one I've just given it. There is no link all the way around. Other ways we can identify people. Face geometry turns out to be much more unique than hand geometry. So if you've passed through an airport recently with an electronically enabled passport and you've put the passport on the scanner and you've tried to look into the thing and you've remembered to take your hat off and your glasses, the computer has measured the distances between your eyes, your nose, your mouth, all the rest of it and worked out, is this the person whose details are stored in the chip on the passport. Again, no external verification at this stage. It's all running on what I've got. Now, okay, the chip in the passport is incredibly well encrypted and quite difficult to fake. But our faces are now being used as identity. Uh, my photograph in the thing has me with glasses on. Today I do not wear glasses because I have my eyes lasered in November. They use iris recognition for two purposes. One is to make sure that the patient under the laser is the patient whose eyes were measured, because you don't want to get that wrong. Um, but also, as your eye moves while the procedure is happening, the laser uses the iris to steer itself to make sure that it's accurate. So iris recognition is safe enough to take a very dangerous weapon and use it to slice the front layer off your eyeballs, not wanting to put anybody off. Um, so how do we unravel this? Because when I log into my bank or my phone or any other important thing, I want to be sure that what I'm logging into is A, the right bank. I don't want it to be some fake bank that's going to then steal all my money, but also the bank or whatever it is wants to be sure it's me. Now, passwords. So, our visual systems have been evolving for something like 700 million years. The eyeball, as we would recognize it, has been in existence for something like 540 million years. This is a long time. Our brains have been processing and recognizing things for hundreds of millions of years. It's really interesting. When you look at the brain, the way the hardware is built, as soon as you see something, the visual cortex starts, you know, I'm looking at this group of people, my visual cortex is taking every frame of that, although it's not quite done in the same way as TV, and uh, parsing it, finding the faces, finding the objects, and pushing them in hardware into the frontal lobes saying, do you recognize this? Do you recognize this? Do you recognize this? Our brains are incredibly good at recognizing things. We are pattern matching systems. We're very bad at remembering things. Try being dyslexic. Hands up. That would be me then few others around the room. Our inferior parietal lobules, about here and here, um, are actually less active than normal people. There is measurable brain function difference in dyslexics. And so this thing called language, spoken language, has existed 40, 50,000 years. Written languages, maybe 5,000 years, maybe a little bit longer. 
13,000 times less long than we've been recognizing things. Written language is a software hack on top of a hardware system, if I can use that analogy. And in the dyslexic brain, it's a bad hack. It doesn't work reliably. When my bank says to me, I need the fifth, the seventh, the eleventh letter from your password, I'm sitting there going, mm, uh, <laughs> and then I realize I've spelt the word wrong. <laughs> yeah? Two thirds of the time, I get this wrong. So what do I do? I write it down. What's that just done? It's just given away my password to anybody who finds the, the post-it note that's sitting on my desk. It's a nightmare. The thing is that most of you who aren't dyslexic will still have written your passwords down somewhere because your brains are not designed to work this way. It's a software hack on a hardware system. So, quick question. How many of you are absolutely sure that you can still remember the text-based password that I asked you to remember at the beginning of the talk? One, a few. Okay, thank you. That's th about what I was expecting. How many of you, and I want you to be really honest here, have uh, a phrase like, I love you, the word November, the word password? in the password that I asked you to remember? One, <laughs> two, three, four, okay, a few. <laughs> now, Santander's rules, which is what I happen to show you, there are seven times 10 to the 35 possible passwords. The reality is that most of you will have used a password with an English language word in it, of which there are not seven times 10 to the 35. Human beings are very, very bad at remembering good passwords. Computers are very, very good at cracking bad passwords. So, this um, is the security blanket. Uh, a researcher and indeed another TED talker uh, did some research. They looked at all of the data breaches in recent years and the size of the word on the security blanket is the proportion of times that password was found in security breaches. And the biggest one there is one, two, three, four, five, six. What is the point of using a system that is fundamentally broken? If in a few words we can have reduced the search space from something that would take the lifetime of the universe to solve to a blink of an eye. A computer can try tens of thousands of passwords a second. So let's change the way of thinking about this. What's the problem with normal passwords? The problem is we all know what the alphabet is and we all know what the dictionary is. That includes the bad guys. So what if we created an alphabet with 100,000 images in it? as represented by this array of very small dots. If I then take a subset of those and offer them to each of you to choose your password, and you choose five, six symbols, it doesn't matter, you can create a story to help you remember the mnemonic style. If I then go back to my whole set and choose a small keypad, so here we have um, 20 symbols. So when you log into your bank, notice it says my bank, honestly, at the top, um, your bank knows who you are because you've told them your username or whatever the system is you're logging onto, it doesn't have to be a bank. And you go and given this keypad, which you can enter your password. Now, using your picture password that came from this symbol set, let's say it's three o'clock in the morning, you've had a heavy night. You need to move some money from your bank account into your credit card account because you've spent too much on food last night. 
you're a little bit worse for wear. And you end up at the fake bank dishonestly. How many of you, using the image-based password that you chose at the beginning of the talk, 14, 15 minutes ago, can enter your password on this keypad? Two, three, four. Okay, so out of a room of about 100 and plus people, three or four of you can get close on this keypad. And somebody's just declined, so it's down to three. Yeah, so statistically, the chances of the bad guys tricking you into giving, you, giving them your password are vanishingly small using this technique. Let's back up a second. How many of you can remember the password, the picture password that I asked you to remember? Yes, more than with the text-based password. And I asked you about the text-based password seven minutes ago. So you've remembered your picture password. And in fact, what you haven't done is remembered it. You've recognized it. We've used the hardware circuits in the brain to push this image back up into your uh, memory so that you've seen it rather than remembered it. Passwords are fundamentally broken. Using images is a way of moving passwords into the way that the human brain works. Thank you.